Now, in the 22nd chapter of the book of Job, we come to the third round. This is the third inning, if you please. This is the third time that these men get into the arena to battle an intellectual battle. And as we've said before, this is not so attractive today. I understand they've attempted now in several colleges to have an intellectual bit of back and forth. And for years, I know we had debating teams because of the fact that we engaged in that years ago and that type of contest. Well, it never attracted too many folk, and it doesn't today. But they're building bigger baseball and football stadiums all over the country. It's a mighty poor city today that doesn't have a gleaming multi-million dollar stadium for athletic events. And very little goes in for the intellectual and even less for the spiritual. But you see, back here, this is an intellectual battle, and it's a spiritual battle. And that is where all of us are fighting. Very few of us have ever been out on the football field carrying the ball or charging or blocking. Very few of us have ever gone up to bat in a major league, but all of us are out in the arena of life today with a spiritual battle, and yet it's not the important one to most people. They'd rather go and sit in the bleachers and watch somebody else hit the ball or somebody else carry the ball. But my friend, you and I are fighting a spiritual battle. We're wrestling, Paul tells us, and here is one going on here. Now, it excited people in that day. But we must remember, they're not civilized like we are today, you know. We build multi-million dollar stadiums for physical combat and not the intellectual. That's not emphasized today. Now shall we move ahead here in this 22nd chapter. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, Can a man be profitable unto God as he that is wise may be profitable unto himself? In other words, Job, you sure think a lot of yourself, but what do you suppose God thinks of you? And that, by the way, is not very comforting to a man in the condition that he's in at this particular time. In other words, Eliphaz is putting it like this, if I may turn this around. What he's saying is, you are acting as if God might derive some benefit from your behavior, and that if he were restraining you, lest you might become too strong for him. And he's sort of holding you back for that reason. Well, may I say, he's way out in left field. And this is certainly not comforting a man that at this moment does need help, and he needs light from heaven. Now, you remember Eliphaz is the man that's had this remarkable experience. It's been strange and mysterious. And he could say, I have seen. He's a spiritualist, but it doesn't seem that he should have gone through all that excruciating and hair-raising experience to come up with some of the trite statements and some of the cliches that he palms off on us. And yet, some of them are very good, by the way. And this is fine. Can a man be profitable unto God? And the very nature of the question reveals that a man can't be profitable to God. That is a very wonderful question, because you see, Job has the same viewpoint that a great many church members have today, that they are really profitable to God. I get the impression from some folk that they really make a real contribution to God down here. He's rather fortunate that they are on his team and, of course, when they get to heaven, <laughs> that's really going to make heaven because of who they are. Well, a man's not profitable to God. You're all unprofitable. And that means you're just a bunch of spoiled fruit. That's what he says about all of us today. Now, he goes on here in this light, "...is it any pleasure to the Almighty that thou art righteous?" Now, we begin now to see the little chink in the armor of this man 
Job. It'll be glaring and apparent in just a few chapters now. But these men do sense that. But the trouble of it is they are not making really a correct diagnosis of the man, and they certainly do not know what the remedy is, and they're not able to comfort him and bring him help as they should. And the very fact that Job claims that he is a righteous man, that doesn't cause God to jump up and down with glee and throw his hat in the air but again. I have a feeling that a great many church members, and I use that term because I wonder about the salvation of some folk that seem to rest so much upon themselves and who they are. We bring no pleasure to the Almighty because of the fact that we're good little Sunday school boys and we've got a pin for perfect attendance, you know. A uh, great many folk think that the Lord is delighted with that sort of thing. And, of course, we've given the impression that the Lord's delighted with it. I don't think so. I totally disagree with that. We need to recognize who we are, and we need to recognize our utter dependence upon God, and we need to recognize our great need of Him and of looking to Him. And instead of trying to do business with him and impress him with the fact of who we are and what we're doing. Now, he goes on to say, Or is it gain to him that thou makest thy ways perfect? In other words, is this something that God can boast of? Now, let's understand one thing, and we're going to see this. This man Job before God on the plus side had many things, so that it could be said when it says he's perfect. It means this man stood in a right relationship with God because of sacrifice. And we find that he was offering sacrifice for his sons and daughters. Now, let me read on here, and let's get the sense of what he's really saying. He says, "'Will he reprove thee for fear of thee?' Will he enter with thee into judgment? In other words, is God afraid to deal with you? Well, of course, apparently God wasn't, because this man Job was having a rough time. Is not thy wickedness great, and thine iniquities infinite? For thou hast taken a pledge from thy brother for naught, and stripped the naked of their clothing. Now, I want you to know what Eliphaz is doing, and it's a mean thing. And it's a thing that, unfortunately, some Christians will indulge in it. And that is gossip. Now, you see, when this thing happened to Job, it caused many people to say, well, wonder what it is in his life. And they didn't seem to be able to pinpoint it. And since there was doubt, what happens? That's when the gossip comes in. And he begins to manufacture something. And before long... Why, he is able to spin quite a yarn out of a little piece of thread. And that's what this man is doing here now. This is the sense of his argument. He says, you are acting, Job, as if God might derive some benefit from your behavior. And as if he were restraining you, lest you might become too strong for him. You're just going to become too good for him. Now, he says, wickedness couldn't be greater. And so Eliphaz says, well, I just might as well tell you, this is what you're guilty of. Now he begins to guess. And here's where the gossip comes in. And none of these things are true. In fact, it puts this man Job on the defense. And instead of defending God, of course, he's defending himself. And if there's nothing wrong with him, then God certainly must have made a mistake and there's something wrong with God. That's always the alternative. Now, listen to him as he speaks to Job. He says, verse 5, Is not thy wickedness great and thine iniquities infinite? Now, here's what the gossips were saying about Job. For thou hast taken a pledge from thy brother for naught, and strip the naked of their clothing. Thou hast not given water to the weary to drink, and thou hast withholden bread from the hungry. 
In other words, he's been a real Mr. Scrooge. That's who Job is, according to the gossip. But as for the mighty man, he had the earth, and the honorable man dwelt in it. Thou hast sent widows away empty, and the arms of the fatherless have been broken. Therefore snares are round about thee, and sudden fear troubleth thee. Are darkness that thou canst not see, and abundance of water cover thee. Is not God in the height of heaven? And behold, the height of the stars, how high they are. In other words, he says, these are the things you've done. And the word's getting out now. After all, God is up yonder, and he's taken note of it. He goes on, is not God in the height of the heaven? Behold, the height of the stars, how high they are. And thou sayest, how doth God know? Can he judge through the dark cloud? In other words, Job, you're doing these things as if God doesn't see you. And God does see you. And you are thinking you're getting by with it. And it's obvious now you didn't get by with it. You see, it all rests upon the wrong premise that Job has some secret sin in his life. And nobody knows about it. And what has come to him has come to him because of judgment. Now he says, thick clouds are covering to him that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. Now what he's saying to Job is, God is high yonder and lifted up. And you don't see him, but he sees you, and he knows about you. Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with the flood? And the thing that he's saying is this. It's the same old argument that he's given from the first. He rests everything upon some experience that he's had. And he can say, I've seen it. I've seen the wicked, he said. And finally, it it all came out and it's revealed. Now, notice he gives a gospel plea here. And this is something that Job didn't need, actually, because Job actually was a man really in right relationship with God. That is, he occupied a redeemed relationship. He could call God, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Now, notice what he says here. And I'll have to drop down now to pick this up. Verse 21, Acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace, thereby good shall come unto thee. Now, that is a Marvelous, wonderful invitation. But it's sort of like invitations given in many churches today. There sit about 99% of the people that are saved, or at least think they're saved, and an invitation is given. Well, it's almost meaningless. It's almost, to my judgment, it sometimes borders on not only the profane, but it borders on the ridiculous to do that. And to ask Job to accept Christ when he's already accepted Christ is not quite the thing. He says, acquaint now thyself with him. And this is a gracious invitation, by the way. It's a good one for today. That's what God says. The Lord Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll rest you. And here it is in the Old Testament. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace and Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Well, it's on what you mean by good. What will be good for us? And sometimes discipline is needed. Now he goes on to say, Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. These men just keep harping on that. Job, deal with the sin in your life. And there's some secret sin there. And they're treating him now as if he's not even related to God at all. And this man is. Now, he goes on to say, Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brook. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. Now, they assume that God is now his enemy, and God is not his enemy. That has been, I think, one of the great deterrents 
today to preaching the gospel. Men are sinners. That should be made very clear. But God today is not at enmity against this world. The gospel has made it very clear that God is reconciled to the world. You don't have to do anything to reconcile God. Christ did that for us. And God has his arms outstretched to a lost world. And he's saying to you, you can come now, but you will have to come my way. You will have to come by the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. But my friend, if you come that way, you are brought in with great abundance and a great welcome and with boldness you can come into the presence of God. So that these men are not really representing God as you can see at this time. And this is no comfort or help to Job. Now, Job's going to answer again. This is the seventh time that he answers. And now he's beginning to have a longing for God. These men keep telling him, but this man has a longing in his heart for God. And the whole point is that the friends are not bringing him into God's presence at all. But listen to Job now. Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Now, Job says, Actually, or you fellows see my condition, and you've heard my complaint. But my condition is worse than it looks, and it's worse than I'm making it. That is the thing that he's saying here. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. Job now has a longing to come into the presence of God. And it'd be wonderful if these men here now knew how to bring him in to the presence of a throne of grace. He doesn't need a throne of judgment. He's already been there, and he's already been to the woodshed, and he's been disciplined. No question about that. Now, somebody needs to bring him into the presence of God. I think that's obvious now. And he goes on to say, I can't find him. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with argument. Now, Job says, I'm ready to go into his presence. But you see, the way Job wants to go into the presence of God, he wants to go in to defend himself. (laughs) Oh, my friend, you don't defend yourself. You just go in and plead guilty before him because you are guilty. And when we find Job getting into the presence of God, he'll have a different story to tell, and he'll change his tune altogether. Now, here he says... I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Job says, I'm wondering what he would say to me, and I'd like to know what that'd be. And he says, I want to know where I can find him. And any man that has that in his heart is going to find him, I can assure you. Verse 8, Behold, I go forward, but he's not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. Well, you can't locate God by running here and there. He's near, nearer than hands, nearer than breathing. He's right close to you. But Job says, I've been running up and down on the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as go. Now there's beginning to break a little light on the soul of Job. And it's this. I'm being tested for a purpose. I don't know what it is. I don't understand a thing. But God is using this in my own life. And my friend, have you discovered that in your own heart, in your own life, that things have come to you and trouble has, and that it has strengthened the fiber of your faith? It has given you a moral character that you never had before and given you a strength and actually a comfort in the time of the storm. You know, he never promised we'd miss a storm. He did promise we'd make the harbor, and that's good enough for me. Now, will you notice what he says here? Verse 12, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Now, Job says something here that reveals that 
he was following the word, but his interpretation apparently was bad. But he has a desire for the word of God. And here again is where God will teach us. You know, some of the lessons that are here in the Word of God, you don't learn them by actually studying them. You'll learn them by experience. Many of them come to us that way. Now, as we come to the 24th chapter of Job, friends, we see Job's answer that he's giving here to Eliphaz, and he is already in the 23rd chapter expressed a desire to find God because the invitation that Eliphaz gave him was, acquaint now thyself with him. Now, Job knows him as Redeemer. He calls him that. But he doesn't understand what's happening to him. And he needs the comfort and the help and the light from heaven. And that hasn't been forthcoming from his friend. Now, Eliphaz also did something else that was quite terrible, I think. He picked up the gossip, because this old natural heart of man, they conceive all kinds of things when they don't know the facts. And they knew Job was suffering, and that apparently God was punishing him, and it was some secret sin. And that was pretty much the understanding. Now, Eliphaz makes a stab at the trouble of Job, And he begins to try to ferret out the thing, that secret sin that he thinks is in his life. And so we find now Job turns to that, by the way, before he finishes answering him. And it causes him actually to become more defensive. In fact, it raises another question with him. And the question is this. Why is God so exacting with me? And he apparently condones the actions of others that are really sinners. And it's out in the open that they are sinners. And so he begins to deal with that in the 24th chapter. Listen to him. He says, Why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? Some remove the landmarks. Now, they're dishonest. They remove landmarks. They violently take away flocks. They steal and feed thereof. They drive away the ass of the fatherless. They take the widow's ox for a pledge. They're dishonest in their dealings, and they take advantage of others, of their need. They turn the needy out of the way. The poor of the earth hide themselves together. And he says, they reap every one as corn in the field, and they gather the vintage of the wicked. Why, he says, the corn crop of the wicked makes as many bushels to the acre as it does to the righteous. And Job says, why does that happen? He says, they've committed murder, they've robbed, they've committed adultery, yet this whole evil brood, they actually are permitted to go down to the grave just like others. That's what he's saying in this chapter. And it's just like snow that's melted by the drought and the heat. They just disappear like the others. And that's not all, he says. Not only are they immune from justice in this life, he says they're actually favored. Because look at his condition. And poor Job is sick in This condition, he looks over at the wicked, and he's getting along nicely. And he says, I just don't understand this. Now, this is the whole thought that we have here in chapter 24. And in other words, instead of helping Job, they've given him another cause for complaint and also of defending himself. He says, I want to know why I'm ferreted out and I'm treated like this. And I suppose that as a minister, when I was pastor, I've heard this. I'm almost willing to say a thousand times. And you know what the question is? Always. Why does God let this happen to me? And that's what Job is saying here. Why is God letting this happen to me? And what is the premise? The premise is, well, I'm such a nice, fine fellow. That crowd over there are wicked. (laughs) Oh, my friends, today... 
That is the question that comes into the minds of many. You see, Job doesn't understand God, and we're going to find out he doesn't understand himself either. And yet he has a great faith in God with the limited knowledge that he has. Now we're going to have the final word from Bildad, that is, from the three friends. And fortunately, it's very brief. And I think that light's beginning to dawn on Bildad, and the light is simply this. And you'll note it in this discourse. He says to himself, he's very thoughtful now, and he was that kind of a man. He's an intelligent man. He says, if Job is guilty, why doesn't he break under all of this bombardment of argument that we've given to him? He still maintained his integrity. He stood up against it. Now, if down underneath, if there had been some rotten spot, if there had been a rotten apple in the barrel, why hasn't it come out in all of this? And this man, of course, goes back to the very basic philosophy of his life, and that is, he's a traditionalist. When I was young, we've been doing it this way for a thousand years, so why do we want to change it? And that God follows certain laws. That is, he's the scientist who pours it in the test tube and says, see, that's what happens every time. He says, look here under the microscope. This is a law, and you can't change it. And the law of God is he'll punish sinners. But why doesn't Job break under this if he's the guilty sinner? And now, let's listen. It's a very brief argument, and he's making it brief because actually he recognizes that he hasn't anything now to offer at all. And you sometimes wish that some folk today I feel like that there are certain men, both theologians and scientists today, that speak so learnedly about the creation of the earth and what God did under certain circumstances and what God must do. And this is the way it must have been two billion years ago. Now, my friend, you may kid other folk. You may drive it into the minds of the young today and have them brainwashed. And we got a brainwashed generation today. But you're listening to one of the biggest skeptics that you've ever heard of. I don't believe you. I don't think you know. And this gross assumption of knowledge is not justified today of what took place two billion years ago. My friend, when you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, What makes you such an authority on what happened two billion years ago? I think you're kidding somebody. I think that you put on a white jacket and pince-nez glasses and you speak ex cathedra and the world listens. My friend, I noticed that they want to sell a toothpaste today or they want to sell a mouthwash or a shampoo. There are only two ways of doing it. One is by sex. The other is by showing a laboratory with a scientist looking through a bunch of boiling acid in test tubes. And he speaks very learnedly. And everybody says, that must be true because he's got on that white coat and he is an authority on this. Now, may I say to you, that may sell toothpaste, but it's not going to sell me on how the world began. And this fellow Bill, Dad, I'll admit these men are smart. I'll admit they're intelligent. But they are brainwashing folk. And they're not, my friend, telling the truth. Now listen to this man, Bill, Dad. And he goes back to the creation, by the way. All of them do. They go back and profess a knowledge. Even these young theologians today. I just get a little weary of them. They know exactly what Genesis, the first chapter, means. Do you? Do you really know? I think that if Moses was here today and could hear some of the things that are spoken, I think he'd smile. And he says, my, how those boys have learned since I wrote that. (laughs) They seem to know more than I knew about it. And I think Moses knew a great deal more 
then we give him credit for also. Now, let me read this. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, Dominion and fear are with him. He maketh peace in his high places. You see, he has an exalted notion of God, and it's good. He says, Is there any number of his armies? And upon whom doth not his light arise? And actually, I think the better translation would be, Whom doth not his light surpass? In other words, God is the supreme one. Now, he goes on in verse 4, How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that's born of a woman? Now, he's asked a good question. In fact, this is the question he should have asked at the beginning, because he so far hasn't given the answer to it. And he's asked the right questions, but he doesn't have the right answers. He says, Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. And they're finding out today that the moon is a pretty dirty thing up there, covered with dust and dirt, volcanic ash. Just not, my friend, a nice place to have a picnic. And it's not as romantic up there as it is down here when you're out with your girl for the first time. And also, Mars seems to be a pretty dirty place also. You and I live in a universe today, friends, that seems to be in a mess, by the way. The stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a worm and the son of man, which is a worm. Now, those that don't like that, but I like it. I think that's what we are. He talked today about that we've come from a worm. We haven't come from a worm, friends. We are a worm. That's what we are now in God's sight. Now, how can a man that is born of a woman, how can he be clean in God's sight? That's the question. It's a good question. It's a supreme question. But they didn't have the answer to this question, by the way. And only Jesus Christ has the answer to that question. I see this little sign up quite a bit today, and that is this. Jesus is the answer. Personally, I resent seeing that because my point is, what's the question? Now, if your question is, how can a man be clean in God's sight, then Jesus is the answer to that. But if your question is, how can I get a ticket to the Rose Bowl game, he's not the answer to that question. I really don't think he's the answer to that question. But if you want to know how a man that's born of a woman a man that's unclean, that David had to say, in sin did my mother conceive me, how am I going to be clean in God's sight? Now, Job, he begins to hit the nail on the head with him. But Job answered and said, this is chapter 26, verse 2, How hast thou helped him that is without power? You didn't have the answer, Bildad, and you didn't have the answer, Eliphaz, and you didn't have the answers so far. You had a lot of talk, but no answers. How savest thou the arm that hath no strength? In other words, Job is saying this. If you cannot answer that question, you can't help me. You've got to be able to answer that question. And in view of the fact that they can't answer that question, then what they've said has been good, but it's of no direct, meaning, nor does it communicate anything to this man Job at all. And what he's saying here again, the better translation, for whom hast thou uttered words? You've been talking a whole lot, but you haven't said anything. And whose spirit came from thee? Who do you think they are? Now listen to him. How hast thou counseled him that hath no wisdom? And how hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is? You came up finally with the right question, but you never did come up with the right answer. And now Job launches in on this, and when he does, he begins to lay his soul bare. Now we're beginning to see the problem 
with this man here. But now let's move, because Job has several... Oh, he has a lot to say through here, and some of it is great, by the way. Now, he moves into this area of the creation of God, and this is something that's tremendous. Let's just listen to it. He says here, verse 5, "...dead things are formed from under the waters." and the inhabitants thereof. Hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Now, there's been so much made of the fact that he stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and they attempt to point today, or did, that there's a void there in the north, no stars in a certain place. But that's before they got these very powerful telescopes, and especially the radio telescopes. My friend, you couldn't point a telescope in any direction, apparently, in God's universe. But what you didn't find, it filled with stars. That is, there are the universes out there. So what he's saying is this, that God can reach out in space, and he just covers it. He can cover the empty place, and he picks out the north here, and he just makes space. Now, space is a creation of God. The Bible teaches that, by the way. In other words, here is a star God created, and billions and billions of light years over yonder is another star. Now, God created it, but what about that space between so they don't rub together or run together? like cars do on our freeways today. How are you going to keep them apart? Well, God puts space between. Now, what is space? Somebody says, that's nothing. It is something. I don't know what it is, but it's something, and God created it. The whole is apart. It's sort of like the lubricant that he uses to keep them apart. Paul makes that clear. He says, I'm persuaded, neither death nor life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, that's time, Things to come, that's the future, nor height, nor depth. Now, height and depth is space, nor any other created thing. So he created space. And my friend, that's something for you to turn over in your mind. What is space? Now, they spent a long time going out to the moon, but what's all this between here and the moon? Well, tell me it's nothing, because it isn't nothing. It's something. What is it? I don't know. I'm no authority on that. I just know it's created, and it's out there. Now he says, and he hangeth the earth upon nothing. Now, who in the world told Job that? And remember, we're back yonder in the days of not of the Antediluvians, I don't think, but at the time of the patriarchs, at least. And here's a man that knows that this earth is hanging out in space. And even... All of the mythologies, even when you come to Greek mythology, they had some weird ideas. You remember the picture that they had that the earth rested upon Atlas? And Atlas stood on an elephant. And an elephant stood on four turtles. But they forgot to tell us what the turtles stood on, by the way. Apparently, you've got to have something down there below the turtles. But they didn't come up with anything. That's sort of like evolution. You just keep pushing it back far enough, and you get it down in some swamp, and it becomes a little bit of dirt and filth or something, and then you've solved it. But the only thing is, where in the world did the swamp come from? Where did the little thing that started it come from? You've got to have somebody winding the thing up, my friend, to get the thing started. So that here is a man that is saying that he hangeth the earth upon nothing, and there's no foundation in under it. And you just wonder what's holding it up. But the thing of it is, if it fell, what direction would it go? Because we talk about gravitation today, pulling down, but that's always down to the earth. And on the other side of the earth, it's the opposite as it is on this side of the earth. So, You can't say that it's all pulling one direction. And when you move way out yonder, there's nothing pulling anything. So where is down and where is up? And is that the reason that 
The earth hangs out there in space. But the reason it hangs out there in space, because by him, the Lord Jesus, all things consist. My friends, we're moving into something that's great here, are we not? I told you, these next few times, in fact, the rest of the way through the book of Job is a marvelous mark. Now we find, as we drop down, and I'm just going to hit the high points here, in verse 13 he says, "...by his Spirit he hath garnished the heavens, his hand hath formed the crooked serpent." As you look out yonder in space, God has garnished the heavens. And I'm of the opinion that he's calling attention here when he mentions the crooked serpent, that he's speaking actually of a constellation out in the heavens. There's been some question about that, whether he's speaking of the serpent as we understand it here upon this earth. But what he's doing now is calling attention to the greatness of God as it is revealed out yonder in the heavens. Friends, we have now come to the last discourse of Job. And it's quite lengthy. Two of the men had already spoken three times, and they are attempting now to answer, and apparently Zophar did not answer this last time. Bildad's last answer, third one, was very weak, by the way, in the sense that it was very brief. He didn't have too much to say. And Zophar didn't answer because Job pauses here in this lengthy discourse when he gets down in chapter 29. It seems as if he waits there for a moment to see if Zophar doesn't want to answer, and Zophar doesn't. So Job continues on till he is through, and then another one there standing in the crowd there that day, member of the audience, why he picks up the discourse and carries on from then until God breaks in. And all during that time, there was a storm gathering on the horizon. And by the time you get to the end of Elihu's discourse, for that's the young man who broke in, well, the storm breaks upon the group, and they all run for cover. And actually, Job is left there. And in the storm, then God deals with Job personally. Now, we are coming actually in this discourse to some really basic material as far as life is concerned, because this book reaches right down where we are. And I think that we can see that below and beneath the suffering this man went through, that there is a great lesson for him to learn. And that is my reason for saying that the book of Job, the main lesson is not suffering, showing how God's saints suffer and the purpose of it. Back of that is the great teaching of repentance. And repentance is largely for a child of God. Now, when a sinner comes to God, Somebody says, isn't he to repent? Well, the Word of God says, Paul said to the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He made no mention of repentance, but repentance is in that word believe, because when you turn to Christ in faith, you turn away from something, and that's sin. In the case of the Philippian jailer, it would be sin and idolatry. And that would be his repentance. But turning to Christ would be the important thing. But many a child of God today and many a lost sinner today is self-sufficient. And anyone that is self-sufficient needs to repent, as this book will reveal. Now, we've gone into that because we are trying to get at the mechanics here as we're drawing toward the end of the book. And now we are beginning to see that the three friends have failed to convince Job. Their ministry was one-sided. And instead of silencing Job, actually they led him forth into a new area of discussion which seemed almost boundless. You think in this section he's not going to quit talking. And he could say to them, you are the people and wisdom will die with you. But I have understanding as well as you, and I'm not inferior to you. Yea, who knoweth not such things as these? 
Well, the fact of the matter is, Job's proven he knows a few things, and he's really attempting to defend himself here. And that actually is not helping anything. It reveals that this discussion did not accomplish anything, although it revealed a great deal, as we shall see. Now, in chapter 27, he continues. And friends, he's going to continue for several chapters here. And I think that we are going to be able to get very well acquainted with Job now before he finishes this. He says in verse 1 of chapter 27, Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, As God liveth, who hath taken away my judgment, and the Almighty who hath vexed my soul, all the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. My lip shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Now, I'd like to give another translation of that, and I think it might be helpful in bringing out the meaning here. As God liveth, he says, who hath taken away my right, and the Almighty who hath embittered my soul, All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips shall not speak unrighteousness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Now, what Job is making very clear here, that he's undaunted, and he's determined, and Zophar hasn't answered, but he's going to keep talking, he says. And he says, I will never admit the charges that you three so-called friends, have brought against me. To the contrary, he says, my righteousness I hold fast. Listen to him here. God forbid that I should justify you till I die. I will not remove mine integrity from me. He's stubborn, isn't he, now? We're beginning to see that all that the friends have done have caused this man to defend himself. And in defending himself here, why, there's no brokenness of spirit, no humility of mind here. And this man is actually making it look as if God is the one who's unrighteous, and he's all right. He says, I'll not remove mine integrity from me. But He's being rather foolhardy in this because before it's over with, he'll be down in dust and ashes. He says, My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. Listen to that man. These friends have not led him to self-judgment. They've only ministered to a spirit of self defense and self-vindication. Job's vindicating himself. Actually, God is not on the scene here. Now, I'll grant that many things they said were true things, and I'm of the opinion that these men had the best intentions. I don't think that they had the truth, although they said things that were true. They talked about experience and tradition and legality, but they never gave Job the truth. And not having done that, they built up the man's ego. And you see, again, let me repeat this, because this is important. They thought that Job had sinned, and they were trying to make him bring it out. Well, Job had not committed some great sin. And Job knew they were wrong. And since they were wrong, he assumed he was right. That's where Job made his mistake. Because they are wrong doesn't make Job right at all. And this man should have been in the presence of God, where there'd be a brokenness of spirit. And that's what trouble will do for you. Someone has said it's like sun. Sun shining on ice will melt it. it may be cold, but it'll melt it. And that's what trouble does for different people. Here is one, a broken spirit, you see, just melted in the presence of God. But not Job, my friend. He's hard now, and he's hard as nails, by the way. He says, my righteousness I hold fast, and I'll not let it go. 
My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. And that's the position and condition of a lot of church members today. They feel the same way. Now, it's not that they do not have the assurance of their salvation. That's wonderful to have that. But my friend, you can be a hard-boiled saint. And actually, it's not assurance of salvation you have, but you have a great big ego. And you feel like that you've got it made. Well, Job thought he had it made, and he's going to find out otherwise. Now, let's follow him down. Listen to him here, verse 7. Let mine enemy be as the wicked, and he that riseth up against me as the unrighteous. My Job's putting everyone who disagrees with him over on the other side. They are his enemy, and they are wicked, and they are unrighteous. I tell you, that's a dangerous position for any man to come to. And then he goes on to talk about the wicked here. What's going to happen to him? And Job gives a little lecture now. And all of his trouble, this man's going to give a lecture about the wicked. For he says, what is the hope of the hypocrite? Though he hath gained when God taketh away his soul, will God hear his cry when trouble cometh upon him? Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call upon God? I'll teach you by the hand of God that which is with the Almighty will I not conceal. And what Job is saying in this chapter is simply this, that the wicked may prosper, but God will eventually judge him. And may I say what he's saying is actually true. But that's not Job's problem. Verse 19, the rich man shall lie down, but he shall not be gathered. He openeth his eyes, and he's not. Well, he says it doesn't make any difference whether he's rich. If he's been a wicked man, why, his life will go out just like a candle blown out by a wind blowing through a window. And actually, the time will come when men shall clap their hands at him and shall hiss him out of his place. Why, can you remember when literally millions saluted Mussolini? And there came a day when they actually walked across his dead body and that of his paramour, when they were down in the mud, having been executed. Yes, the wicked are going to be judged. They're going to come to an end. There's no question about that. But that hasn't answered Job's problem at all. But he's full of words. Here he goes again. He's taken off in chapter 28. And friends, let's listen to him. Because here is one of the most beautiful poems of creation that you will find anywhere. And he deals with things here that are absolutely wonderful. And if we were studying poetry, I'd spend a long time here. We're not studying poetry, but will you notice it? Surely there is a vein for the silver and a place for gold where they find it. Iron is taken out of the earth and brass is molten out of the stone. He setteth an end to darkness and searcheth out all perfection the stones of darkness and the shadow of death. Now, he's talking about how God puts down silver and gold and iron and precious stones in the earth. Now, he says here, He setteth an end to darkness and the stones of darkness and the shadow of death. It's difficult to find these things. I personally do not think that man has found near the treasure that's really in this old earth that we live in today. I think this chapter makes it clear, and I think it also makes it clear that there are precious stones we know nothing about that have never yet been discovered that would be more valuable than the diamond or any other. Listen to this. The flood breaketh out from the inhabitant. Even the waters, forgotten of the foot, they are dried up. They are gone away from man. As for the earth, out of it cometh bread and under it is turned up as it were fire. In other words, not only does the earth turn up precious stones, but also it turns up grain, bread for us to eat. Now listen to this here. Verse 6, The stones of it are the place of sapphires, and it hath dust of gold. There is a path which no fowl knoweth. Now, birds fly over these mountains. And they know where there's certain veins. They can't tell us, apparently, but they fly over it. And which the vulture's eye hath not seen. 
but down in the earth and in the mountains. There is a vein that even the fowls don't know anything about, and the vulture doesn't know about it. And verse 8, the lion's whelps have not trodden it, nor the fierce lion passed by it. I say because of this that there's a great deal in this earth of precious stones and of valuables and of riches and wealth. Man haven't even tapped it yet. They haven't even touched it. That's what I believe that this passage is making clear to us. He putteth forth his hand upon the rock. He overturneth the mountain by the roots. That's the earthquake. He cutteth out rivers among the rocks, and his eye seeth every precious thing. He bindeth the floods from overflowing, and the thing that is hid bringeth he forth to light. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Now, Job says, all of this, valuable things are in the earth. Well, where are you going to get wisdom and understanding? In other words, he's telling his friends, they haven't found it. Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. The depth saith, it is not in me, and the sea saith, it's not with me. And very frankly, if I may again voice an opinion... I do not believe that all of this probing of the ocean's floor and of probing space and of going into every crevice in the earth is going to tell man anything relative to what real wisdom, real knowledge is. That is, as to the origin of the earth and how it came into existence. I don't think man's going to find it there at all. And he goes on to say, It cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. We're paying billions of dollars to bring rocks back from the moon. And they're expensive rocks, by the way. But they're not telling man what he'd like to know, I'm sure. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx of the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels, a fine gold. In other words, this wisdom that Job hoped their friends would bring to him is a wisdom that is actually beyond the understanding of man. And he goes on here to talk in verse 19, "...the topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold." And the Bureau of Standards just can't evaluate this at all. Whence then cometh wisdom? And where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living and kept close from the fowls of the air. Destruction and death say, we've heard the fame thereof with our ears. We've heard about it. We've had a rumor about it. But even death ought to tell us something. It ought to tell us there's something on the other side. And it ought to tell us that there's something we don't know. Man just stepped through the door of death, friends, and they're not able to communicate back at all. Houdini, when he died, the great magician, years ago, he left a code with his wife, and he said, I'll try to communicate with you. The dead can communicate with the living. And spiritualist after spiritualist came to Miss Houdini, said, I've heard from him. She said, give me the code. And none of them ever came up with it, which simply means that You just don't get word back from over there. That ought to tell us that there's something we don't know today. Now, he goes on, and verse 26 is an interesting verse. When he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder. And the interesting thing is that for years there were those that said that this was wrong, that anyone knows that you see the lightning And then you hear the thunder, and yet here it's the lightning of the thunder. But since then, they found out that sound waves do not travel as fast as light waves, so that you see lightning, but you hear the thunder afterward. But actually, the thing happened, the lightning is the flash from the crash of the thunder that takes place. And this is accurate, and it's amazing how the writer of the book of Job knew all of that. Now we come to chapter 29. We'll be able to make actually a diagnosis of the case that Job has that he's suffering from.
I think that we'll be able to get him in God's clinic and put the x-ray on him. And we'll find out that the problem that this man had, that actually his friends were not able to probe at all. And I can, I think, give you an indication. I think I've already done that. He's suffering, actually, from a bad case of perpendicular aetis. Now, that is a very bad disease. That's when the little pronoun I becomes so important, and that's all we talk about, I, I, I. In chapter 29, and I'd like to suggest you read this over and see, Job in chapter 29, there are 25 verses, and he uses the personal pronoun I or me 52 times. And you get the impression Job's talking about himself. He's really wrapped up in himself in this chapter here. That, my friend, was the big problem that Job had. Now we're going to see how it had affected his life. And it affects the life of human beings today. You know, to get all wrapped up in yourself. And someone says, when you're wrapped up in yourself, it makes a mighty small package. Now we find out what the secret sin of Job is. And Job confesses it here, but he doesn't give it to us in the form of a confession. It's really his boasting. He's filled with pride. And if you want to know what the name of the disease is, it's eye trouble. A lot of us have that trouble, by the way. He is just talking about eye, eye. He has eye eaters. And this is the hub of the wheel of life for all of us, of course. And everything is a spoke that goes out from us. But we see no brokenness of spirit. There's no broken and contrite heart here on the part of Job. No admission, no confession, no feeling of failure. His friends did not help him. They failed, and they didn't know Job. And they didn't know themselves, and they certainly didn't know God. They believed that God only sent trouble as punishment, and Job was just holding out. And they roughed him up. They were miserable comforters. Their method was different. If I may sum up, Eliphaz was the voice of experience. He uses what would be called today the psychological approach. And this is the approach that is known as the power of positive thinking today. You adopt a cheerful attitude. And then there is Bildad, and he's a traditionalist, and he uses the philosophical approach. That would be the approach of several of our seminaries today. They use the philosophical approach. But that doesn't help anybody. And then Zophar, it was a religious dogmatist. And he thought he knew all about God. And he sounds like some of us fundamentalists. We're all here, but the thing is, none was able to help this man. Now, we need to recognize this, and I want to say this on Job's behalf as we get into this chapter. We're told that this man was a perfect man according to the standard that God had set up, which was sacrifice. And Job had brought a sacrifice to God. We saw a little chink in his armor, though at the very beginning he offered sacrifices for his sons and daughters. He thought they had sinned. But what about Job? He didn't apparently think he needed one, you see. And we find him that kind of a man. And we find that he's a man that had a great deal, a very wealthy man. He had all that it takes to make this life agreeable. And he had what it took to make him important in the world. And then we're told some of the things that he did. He was a religious man. He feared God. He had a concern for his children. And he didn't put up a false front. You could weigh him on the scales of God's throne. And Job was not a hypocrite. We can say that. The insinuation of his friends was base and low. He was a genuine saint of God, a quickened soul, a child of God. And the earthly cup of bliss 
was full and running over. Now, why should this man suffer? Actually, the suffering is incidental, but Job would never have told you that. It's just about as important a suffering as the fish is in the book of Jonah. The problem was with Jonah and Jehovah. The problem here is with this man Job and God, and Job and Jehovah again. Even Satan, his enemy here, is secondary. Now, the real problem was Job. He did not know himself. He did not know God. And he certainly didn't know himself here at all. Socrates put it like this, Gnosko emu. That means know yourself. Know myself. That's important. And this man here, he didn't think that he needed a sacrifice. His children did. And he was self-righteous, self-sufficient. And he received all kinds of compliments. And there was a little of the self-adulation and spiritual egotism that you see in this man's life. But now, God's going to begin to work on him. Now, you can just say of chapter 29, this is your life, Job. Here it is. And he's going to tell us about himself. And he begins to review it. Now, will you listen? Chapter 29, beginning at verse 1. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, Oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me. He starts off as being outstanding. He's all about me. This is very interesting. It goes like that little poem. I can't put my hand on it right now that I have. I gave a little tea party. And there were only three present, and it was me, myself, and I. I want to tell you, that's the kind of tea party that he's given here. Now he goes back to the good old days. Things are not like they were in the good old days, he says. He goes on in verse 3 and says, "...when his candle shined upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness." Those were the good old days when Job had it going good for him. Now he says here in verse 4, will you listen to him? As I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle. Here's a man that served God. And here was a man that from his youth he served God. He was just all right, by the way. And he goes on to tell us, In verse 5, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me, and when I washed my steps with butter, and the rock poured me out rivers of oil, he was prosperous. Everything he touched turned to gold. When I went out to the gate through the city, when I prepared my seat in the street, the young men saw me and hid themselves And the aged arose and stood up. I tell you, those were the good old days. He's not only prosperous, but he was a man of influence. The young kids had run from him. He was a great man. And not only that, the aged man, when they saw him coming, they all stood up, took their hat off, bowed to him. He was that kind of a man. And the princes, verse 9, the princes refrained talking and laid their hand on their mouth. In other words, when I came up, anybody's talking, they quit talking. They waited for me to say something, you see. Verse 10, The nobles held their peace, and their tongue cleaved to the roof of their mouth. Why, even the nobility, they listened to him, and they're not about to talk in his presence unless he asks them to. Now, not only that, listen to this. When the ear heard me, then it blessed me. And when the eye saw me, it gave witness to me. That's verse 11. In other words, he was voted the most valuable citizen by the civic clubs of Uz in Chaldea. He was the outstanding citizen of the town. Verse 12, now notice. Because I delivered the poor that cried. He provided pensions for the aged. He helped the poor and also the fatherless. He was for orphans' homes. 
and him that had none to help him. He surely went into social service. He believed in helping your fellow man. That's what Job did. And he's boasting of it here. My, he's outstanding. A man that's like this, friends, just doesn't need a Savior. He's already good enough. That is according to himself. Now, will you notice he goes on here. The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me. Why? Well, he took care of it. And I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. He took care of the widows. My, this man was thoughtful, was he not? He's outstanding. Now, listen to him here. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. In other words, he was adorned with good works. He was filled with good works. And my judgment was as a robe and a diadem. People came to him for advice on any subject. He was outstanding. Now listen to him, verse 15. I was eyes to the blind, and feet was I to the lame. He was chairman of the board at the blind school, and he was a benefactor of the crippled children's home. Now, my friend, this man Job's outstanding, and I don't mean to take anything from him. He's outstanding. We need citizens like this. Now, notice this. Verse 16, I was a father to the poor, and the cause which I knew not I searched out. And he never gave to anything unless he investigated it and saw it was a good thing to give to. And that's something that a lot of the believers don't do today. Now, this man here only supported that which he felt was a worthy cause. Now, listen to him in verse 17. And I broke the jaws of the wicked, and I plucked the spoil out of his teeth. Now, he was on the committee of the mayor for civic righteousness. He believed in law and order. And I tell you, he was influential enough to bring it to pass. I say to you that this man Job is an outstanding man. Now, will you listen, verse 18. Then I said, I shall die in my nest, and I shall multiply my days as the sand. This man here said, why, I've got it made. <laughs> I've got everything I want for retirement. I'm going to die in my nest and I'll multiply my days as the sand. I'm going to live to a ripe old age. I tell you, he certainly thought he had it made. And now listen to him. He says, My root was spread out by the waters, and the dew lay all night upon my branch and my family tree. I tell you, it was outstanding. Verse 20, listen to him. My glory was fresh in me, and my bow was renewed in my hand. He had good health, and that's a wonderful asset. Now, he goes on here, verse 21. Unto me men gave ear and waited and kept silence at my counsel. In other words, all the groups sought out his advice. They telephoned him before they'd make a decision because they said, this man Job is outstanding. And not only that, after my words they spake not again, and my speech dropped upon me. Why, the governor of the state called him. And the Supreme Court, before they rendered a decision, wanted to talk it over with him. My, I tell you, this man Job was outstanding, was he not? And he says here, verse 22, And my words they spake not again, and my speech dropped upon them. In other words, he didn't have to say it, but one time they were listening. Verse 23, and they waited for me as for the rain, and they opened their mouth wide as for the latter rain. In other words, they just would hang on every word that this man gave. And listen to him, verse 24. If I laughed on them, they believed it not. And the light of my countenance, they cast not down. They just wanted to do him a favor. Everybody wanted to be in his good graces. And now he concludes all of this I talk. There's been a whole lot of I here. Fifty-two times now. Verse 25. I chose out their way and sat chief, and I dwelt as a king in the army, as one that comforteth the mourners. In other words, Job was the top man on the totem pole of life. He dwelt in honor, affluence, and influence. He was a plutocrat, a tycoon. He was an ideal man. 
the goal toward which humanity is striving today. He lived the good life. He knew what abundant living was. He lived in a place of affluence. But Job lived in a fool's paradise. It was a world of make-believe. It was holly sham, smug complacently. He was in a Cinderella world. When the clock would strike midnight and his chariot would turn to a pumpkin, he had false security, and he was an Alice in Wonderland. And then an atomic bomb fell on his nest, but he told us, you remember back in the third chapter, that which I dreaded happened to me. He felt that all of this material substance could be wiped out and taken from him in a moment. It was, and he had nothing to fall back on. And even his friends didn't cushion his fall at all. In fact, they made him fall with a terrible, terrible, resounding blow. And this man here, he's been putting on his own self-righteousness. Listen to him. Verse 14 again. I put on righteousness. It clothed me. Man, he could just put on his self-righteousness. Do you know anybody like that? And in this chapter now, 52 times, he's got eye trouble. 52 times. I, 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 me, me, me. He has aidas. This man, no broken and contrite spirit. No admission. No confession. No feeling of failure. And that is the condition of him. 